This is a quick start side story. In the last episode regarding the Toshiba Cosmio, I mentioned that a small handful of laptops have the ability to function as standalone HDMI monitors, but this is extremely rare and I wasn't sure why because it seems technically very straightforward. Now I hadn't intended to dwell on that subject since I, I figured it wouldn't really be material for the Quick Start series. I also couldn't figure out which machines could do it for sure. And of the ones I could find, the prices on eBay were not worth it. So I didn't really intend to follow up, but then I stumbled on one of the machines that can do it. This is an Alienware M17X R4 and we'll jump right to the chase. On the left side, we've got the usual HDMI out and on the right side, we have HDMI in. Let's uh, see this happen. Uh, I've got the machine running. Uh, it's got Windows 10 on it and now I'm gonna get my Xbox 360. Just gonna plug into the HDMI port on the side here. And there we go, HDMI in mode enabled. Give it a moment. And there's the Xbox 360, bip bop. Uh, let's uh, go fire up Halo. The speakers on this thing are a little blown out so they distort from time to time. There it is, uh, we got the picture, we got the sound. Our laptop has become a television exactly as promised. Uh, and if I hit this key combo, HDMI in, we go right back to Windows. And if I hit it again, we're back on the 360. So there it is, really neat feature. Now, why are we here? Is this machine actually part of the Quick Start family? No, not at all. But I'm making this an episode anyway, because I think it could have been. Like most machines in this series, besides the one feature that I'm here to address, there's really not much to write home about. In fact, I'd say that the most interesting thing about this machine is the fact that nobody noticed the HDMI input feature, as far as I can tell. This was a fairly high-end gaming rig when it came out in 2012, so it got plenty of coverage, but all the reviews I can find focus exclusively on its gaming performance. None of them spend more than five or six words on the HDMI input. At best, they say in passing that you can use it to play console games. That's it. They don't bother mentioning whether there's any latency or what the user experience is like or anything. At worst, they don't even mention it's there. Most reviews actually ignored it completely. Now, this is bizarre to me. Even if you don't think it's much of a value add, how could you leave something so unusual out of your review entirely? I don't get it. So I guess I gotta make sure that this gets documented even if it's 11 years late. Now, just to get our bearings, let's uh, look over this machine very briefly. It's from 2012, like I said, and if I'm not mistaken, it was one of the better gaming laptops on the market at the time. It got good reviews everywhere I've looked, and the hardware itself is pretty solid. This is the low trim model, but it still sports a Core i7 quad core, third gen. It came with six gigs of RAM that I upgraded to eight and a GeForce GTX 660M. The top trim model had a 680M, but both seem pretty decent. This screen is 17 inches, the perfect size. And if this was the high trim, it would be a 1080 panel. This one's only 1600 by 900, which is kind of disappointing, but the reduced resolution probably helps make up for the slightly slower GPU. Now, 2012 was kind of a transitional year for computing, so this thing has kind of a mix of modern and archaic features. The trackpad isn't as big as the one on my 2022 Lenovo Legion, for instance, but it's certainly much larger than the little baby ones we had in the mid 2000s, so that's more or less modern. On the other hand, this machine still has an optical drive, a technology that I think disappeared from laptops at most a couple years later. Uh, this one is a DVD burner, but it was available with a Blu-ray, which would have paired really well with the full HD display. It has HDMI and mini display port outputs, which is modern enough, but it also offers VGA, which isn't so modern. And it has four USB 3.0 ports, which is a tremendous relief for anyone used to dabbling with old laptops like me. I'm so sick of USB 2.0, it's so slow. But it also has a combo USB and eSATA port, which somehow feels more outdated to my eyes than an ISA slot. All this stuff is pretty normal for the era, however, and like any gamer machine from any era, it also takes a power supply with the displacement of a cruise ship that weighs in at over 180 watts. 
The machine itself is also gigantic. It, it actually doesn't quite compare to the Toshiba Cosmio from the last video in terms of volume. That one's still a little bit bigger, but it's still somehow less comfortable to carry around. I'm a pretty big guy, but this doesn't really quite fit under my arm. It, it actually hurts to stick under here. I'm in pain right now. The Cosmio, on the other hand, against all odds, is actually considerably more comfortable to carry. Wow, Jimmy, why does your mom let you have two laptops? This thing is a real battleship, and that's just it. You know, it's not really a laptop. It's an embarrassed desktop gaming rig. You would have bought this in order to play Far Cry 3 or, or CSGO in hotel rooms or while crashing on a friend's couch, which is indeed where I've seen the majority of Alienware machines being used. It's not meant to be tucked under your arm and carried to the coffee shop. Although, if for some reason you decide to do that, this apparently had a shockingly long battery life. Five and a half hours when web browsing, which is way above the average for a 17-inch machine. If you were playing games on it, however, you'd be looking at more like 40 minutes. Now, I'm not very good at doing benchmarks. I don't really know how to set things up to get the right results, so I'm not going to waste a bunch of time trying to show you how the machine performs, but I have indeed played CSGO on it, and it works just fine. There's your benchmark. With the games I've tested, it does seem to run a bit slower than reviews suggest, maybe because nobody reviewed the 660M version, but it could also be because those games have all since been patched, or just because this machine is old and broken. It's in fairly good condition for the most part, but who knows if it's cooling properly, and for what it's worth, it did get dropped on the front edge at some point because the speaker grills are both busted. That may have something to do with its audio problems. It doesn't really come across when I try to record it, but basically all bass frequencies come out horribly distorted, and that tends to turn video game soundtracks into sort of bitchin' noise core. So like I said, the machine's mostly unremarkable, other than the HDMI input feature, and you've pretty much seen all there is to that already. It mostly just works. If we're trying to answer a question in this video, it would be this. Why isn't this feature more common? Laptops all have video outputs. Why don't they all have video inputs so you can use their built-in displays with other devices? Well, I'm not entirely sure. I've researched and learned how Dell slash Alienware implemented this feature, and it seems like they did it exactly the way I imagined, with the components I imagined, wired up the way I imagined, with results that are almost exactly what I imagined. My conclusion, having seen this proof of concept, is that I was right. This could be a universal feature. That said, I think I understand why it isn't. First, let's head something off. What you might assume is going on here is that the input port connects to a capture card that hangs off the machine's PCIe bus. And when you plug in a device, Alienware just has a piece of software installed that notices the input and puts up a full screen window that displays the captured video. If that were the case though, I'd have some pretty negative things to say about this machine. I mean, let's give credit. You'd probably be able to use that input in OBS or whatever, and a capture card built into a laptop is a pretty cool idea, especially for 2012, but it wouldn't really do the thing I said in the premise. You wouldn't be able to use this laptop as a replacement for a TV or a monitor. It would work for some purposes, but let's be real. If you were using this machine like that, you'd be putting a game console into it. And a capture and display solution like that would most likely introduce tons of latency, reduced color depth, and possibly further problems. Fortunately, that is not how this works. I found a diagram of the circuitry inside this machine. I can't use it directly in the video, and it's kind of confusing anyway, so I'm just gonna lay out the parts we're concerned with. You can confirm all this fairly easily if you're skilled with the Google. To put it very simply, the internals are laid out like so. The HDMI input comes in and lands directly on a chip that converts it to LVDS. That stands for Low Voltage Differential Signaling, which is kind of meaningless. It's a very generic term. It could almost describe any interconnect developed in the last 20 years, like PCIe and HDMI. I get the impression that when people use this term, it's really a euphemism for one or more common protocols that nobody wants to name for some reason. At any rate, however, LVDS is very commonly used to connect LCD panels in all kinds of devices. Now, in a laptop, the GPU can often output LVDS directly, so that's a native interface, but panels in desktop monitors often use it too, so there'll usually be a chip that takes your HDMI, DisplayPort, or even VGA input and converts it to LVDS, and that would be exactly the same kind of chip that's in this machine. 
Now this being a gaming laptop, it of course has two graphics adapters. That's very common. There's the built-in Intel graphics and a high performance Nvidia GPU that only engages when you're playing a 3D game. Now both can output LVDS natively. So under normal operation, this is very simple. There's a chip called a MUX or multiplexer that selects between the signals from whichever the graphics adapters is active at the moment and routes them to the LCD panel. Unlike most machines, however, the output of that MUX then goes into another MUX, which takes the input from the HDMI converter and chooses between the two. The MUX is essentially just an electrically controlled switch. So in other words, when this is running in input mode, it's basically just a monitor. The HDMI comes in, turns into LVDS and goes right into the panel. There's no emulation, no capturing, no processing between input and output. Honestly, most normal televisions and even some monitors have a more complex signal path. This is as basic as it gets. So if you were worrying about latency, don't. This does just fine. I mean, I don't have a trained eye or dedicated test gear, but it seems perfectly okay to me. I've played on TVs with bad processing delay. This ain't that. I tried playing some video games on the thing. Uh, I did the 240p suite latency test through a RetroTINK 5X scaler, which has basically zero lag. And I'm pretty convinced that this is adding none of its own. And I mean, why would it? In HDMI input mode, this is basically the ideal HDMI display device that every nerd wants. It just does not get simpler than this, at least in the best case. As I said, many LCD panels use LVDS, but some use a thing called Embedded DisplayPort, or EDP. If you happen to get a machine with that kind of display, then the HDMI input, after being converted to LVDS, then goes through another converter, which turns the LVDS into EDP. So, two conversions. That's not ideal. I don't know if it would add latency. Uh, since it's all done with dedicated chips rather than a complex DSP, I suspect it would be very minimal, but an upstream HDMI splitter or switch would still have been preferable. With that nitpick aside though, that's pretty much the whole technical explanation of the input feature. It's so simple, there's just not much to talk about. While we're on the topic though, I did learn during this process just how complex the graphics circuitry in gaming laptops can get. This machine supports two different kinds of LCD panels, plus external displays over HDMI, DisplayPort, and VGA. And on top of that, it also supports wireless HD. This was apparently a big up and coming thing in 2012 that did pretty much what it says. It let you beam your display to your TV instead of using a cable and supposedly with zero latency. That just withered and died for whatever reason a couple years later, but not before Alienware built it into some machines, including this one. Uh, it could be had with a wireless HD transmitter and that becomes a sixth possible output. The end result is that there's a total of nine multiplexer chips in this machine. It took me a moment, how many, how many fingers is nine? I got it. There's a total of nine multiplexer chips in this machine to handle every possible output configuration. And that also seems less than ideal, but to Dell's credit, everything I've tested still works 12 years later. Nothing's desoldered itself from the board due to waste heat or anything. So I guess I can't complain. So what do we think about this computer? Well, I think there's no argument really. It's very cool. If I could have had one of these in 2012, I would have killed for it. It's super neat. But if it was just a laptop that could be a TV, I really wouldn't have enough material for a video. This would probably be a short. Fortunately, or not, uh, there are some problems worth discussing. First, there's the audio issue. When I initially tested this thing, I wasn't getting any sound. It turns out this is because the sound implementation really sucks. I have to be frank, I could have missed something here because I don't have the manual for this machine. Dell is pretty good about maintaining this stuff on their website, but they made a boo-boo here. Uh, the thing they have labeled as the user's manual is actually a technician's guide. As a result, all the crappy getmanuals.com type sites have just mirrored that. So even if a physical manual ever existed, nobody's gonna bother scanning and uploading it. So I don't know what Dell's instructions for the audio were. I had to guess the solution and it seems to work like this. You go into the Windows sound control panel, you find the HDMI input device, and you tell Windows to play that input through your speakers. Windows then opens an audio streaming session between the input and the output. When you connect your game console, hey, great, you get your audio, but this is not a great way to do this for several reasons. Uh, the biggest is that, once again, it can add a ton of latency. Now, to be honest, it seems fine to me but I'm kind of surprised by that. Normally when I've used this feature, I can hear a very clear delay. I'm sure there's some, I mean, a fight game player would probably be pretty mad about it. Uh, but as far as I could tell though, this is how you're supposed to do it. 
I did find some people discussing this on forums. They recommend a similar approach, except they say to do it through the sound card control panel. This machine actually has a name brand sound blaster, which I don't think I've ever seen in a laptop before. And the drivers have their own option for passing through the HDMI audio. So, okay, maybe that mixes it in hardware rather than going through the Windows sound system. That could decrease latency, but I have no proof that it does. And it still sucks that we have to do it this way at all. For one thing, it means you can't mute your PC. If Windows updates pop up or you get a Discord notification or something like that, you're gonna hear those sound effects over the top of your external audio. Now, maybe you want that, in which case, great. But the fact remains that you can't disable it unless you use the Windows sound mixer to manually turn down every other program, which blows a lot. Also, the audio input only works when the HDMI input is selected. So as soon as you switch back to Windows, your game audio goes dead. That's probably what most people want most of the time, but it should be a toggleable option. I mean, come on. Here's another thing. Uh, this is a 1600 by 900 panel. How many consoles can output 900p? Probably none of them. I don't have test gear to sniff the signal, so I can't verify what resolution my 360 is truly putting out, but none of the options are 1600 by 900, and when I set the thing to 1080p, it seems to output that. My RetroTank 5X also lets me force its output to 1080, and that works too, so we can assume that this thing is willing to accept 1080p if offered. That means that either the LVDS converter or the driver on the LCD take whatever they get and scale it to fit the panel. This is also not ideal. We don't know what kind of algorithm this is using, but it's certainly not gonna be an integer scale. There's no direct conversion to 1600 by 900 from either 1080 or 720. So there's gonna be some amount of degradation. Honestly though, at only 17 inches, I doubt anyone's gonna notice. I certainly can't tell. And more importantly, I doubt anyone who would have bought this machine would have cared. Nobody would have thought they were getting a top of the line monitor here. The whole point of the input mode would have been convenience. Going back to my story from the last Quick Start video, I suggested the Toshiba Cosmio as the perfect gift for the college kid stuck in a tiny dorm with room for a laptop and a console, but not a dedicated TV. Well, that was in 2006, so fast forward six years. Analog video has pretty much died, HDMI is the interface du jour, bam, this is the updated product for that same use case. Unlike the Cosmio though, this can't record its input, and that is a bummer. Uh, it'd become a lot more relevant in the intervening years to capture video. Consider that a year later, Sony put out the PlayStation 4 with a dedicated share button right there on the gamepad just for taking clips and screenshots. If this thing had been able to record your console gaming sessions, that would have been sick as hell. But it also would have been complicated as hell. Putting aside any issues with HDCP, which probably would have been a real concern, you could be pretty sure that Dell would not have implemented this the way we'd hope. What you'd want is for the HDMI to come in and hit a splitter with one output going to an onboard capture card and the other going through the LVDS converter just like it does here. That way you get the capture and you also get minimal latency on the built-in screen. That's not what they would have done. If there had been a capture card in this machine, you know they would have chosen to save a few bucks on the splitter, the LVDS converter, and the extra MUX chips, and just done the thing that I said earlier. You'd plug in your input, it would open a full screen capture window, and you'd get your game in beautiful 420 chroma subsampling, heavily H.264 compressed with six frames of latency. The whole thing would be pointless and unusable. That's exactly how it would have gone. We all know it. But even though we know Dell would never have done this right, I think it could have been a good candidate for a quick start solution, or at least a quasi quick start. I mean, as a direct follow on to the Cosmio, I'm not sure it would have flown. The Cosmio was sold as a multimedia machine in an era when that still made sense. But by 2012, that just wasn't really a distinct market anymore. Dell did offer this machine with a Blu-ray drive, so they must have imagined that you might want to watch movies on it. If you could also record TV shows to watch later, that'd be neat too, but I don't know how much market overlap there would have been, nor do I know if there were copy protection concerns, and it wouldn't make much sense to do all that without also building in a TV tuner, which is really getting off in the weeds, making an entirely different product. Consider, however, a much simpler concept. The LCD display here is a standalone module. If you apply five volts to it, it'll turn on, light up, and wait for a signal. The LVDS converter chip and the MUXs are also standalone. They don't depend on any PC software or hardware. And that means that Dell could have put a button on here that powered up just those components and left the rest of the machine turned off. Now, what would this get you? Well, okay, in its most pie-in-the-sky interpretation, you'd have a portable 17-inch HDTV with a high-density battery pack. 
that's pretty cool, but I admit it's of limited usefulness. Portable devices with HDMI output are not terribly common, so there wouldn't be much point to this. If you had something to plug your game console into for power, you could just plug your TV into the same thing. I mean, maybe you're out camping and you brought an inverter that was just barely powerful enough to run your 360 and its monster PSU with no extra power to run a TV. This would solve that problem, but I admit it's a very tiny edge case. What it would get you, however, is a portable TV that doesn't require a whole PC running in the background at all times. If we're talking about sensible product design, that's really what does this thing in. You can switch to HDMI input mode, but the rest of the machine is still there, idling at 40 to 50 watts minimum at all times. You can't see Windows, you can't interact with it, why does it need to be on, wasting power? It's nice that you can run both things at once, but how often would you? I think it's a lot more likely that you'd play Halo 4 for six uninterrupted hours and never flip back to Windows even one time. And even if you don't care about the wasted power, you still have to worry about the state of the machine. If it goes to standby or applies updates and restarts, it's gonna unceremoniously cut off the video from your console. Ugh. I really wish that Dell had designed this as an independent function of the machine. Unfortunately, I think part of why they didn't comes down actually to the sound situation. They're using the Sound Blaster to mix and amplify the audio from the HDMI, and unfortunately that can't run on its own. It needs the operating system and the drivers to function. So to get sound from HDMI without running the PC, they would have had to pack in a separate audio amplifier and switch the speakers between that and the Sound Blaster, and of course, then if you did want to hear your PC audio at the same time as your external audio, you wouldn't be able to because now the Sound Blaster wouldn't be hooked up when you're looking at the HDMI. It just sucks. And there are probably plenty of good solutions, but I'm sure that when it comes down to it, Dell never wanted to sell portable TVs. If they had, they would have solved these problems, but I think they didn't because this is just an engineering novelty. I'm sure the only reason they included it at all is because it only took a couple chips and a few lines of code. If polishing it required any more parts or R&D, if they'd really had to think about it any, they never would have bothered. As far as I can tell, HDMI input only persisted for one more year, and only in the form of a bi-directional port on the first version of the Alienware 17 that probably most people never realized was there. A year later, it disappeared, and I don't think any other vendors ever included it. And that's how features on the PC always go. This was never going to be something you could rely on to be implemented well or to be there in the next model year. So while I still insist that every laptop should be able to do this, I think it's not hard to see why no manufacturer is interested in trying. It introduces too many questions that demand too much work to answer, all for an audience that would never be larger than niche. Still, I can dream of a more interesting world than the one we usually get. Ain't that what I do here? And hey, if you like what I do here, then consider subscribing to my channel so you can find out when I do more of it. Remember to turn on notifications if you want a 15% chance of YouTube maybe telling you when I upload. And if you really like what I'm doing, then consider supporting me on Patreon like these folks here are doing. This is my full-time job, and it involves a lot of wandering around local e-waste stores and eBay, hoping interesting things will show up, or buying what shows up and hoping it's interesting. My patrons make all that possible. They also put food on my table and gas in my tank, so I really couldn't do this without them. I'm incredibly grateful for all their support. Thank you all so much, and to everyone else, thanks for watching. They're Bluetooth headphones, by the way.